Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm thrilled to see so many of you here tonight. I'm Vas Christodoulou, the How To Academy's Deputy Director and the producer of our weekly podcast series. Tonight's event is the latest in a series of collaborations between How To Academy and the New York Times, entitled How To Understand Our Times. Its mission is to improve the world by sharing knowledge, insight, creativity, and understanding. And our guest speaker tonight has been doing that through his column in the Times for more than 20 years. He also writes a free weekly newsletter that I strongly recommend you subscribe to if you aren't subscribed already. I mean, of course, Paul Krugman. Paul was the Nobel Laureate for Economics in 2008 and is a distinguished professor at City University of New York. Tonight, he's in conversation with the tortoise editor, Guardian columnist, and acclaimed author, Matthew Dancona. Please give them both a warm welcome. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, well, good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to this uh, special occasion. I, um, I was just saying to Paul earlier that I think I've actually been reading his column for all of its 20 years, and so it's a particular thrill for me, and I hope um, the conversation we're going to have will be stimulating for you too. Um, I think there are very, uh, he falls into a, a, a unique category, which is someone who is both a Nobel laureate and has also had a cameo in a film with uh, Russell Brand and Joan Hill. I don't think it's a fairly small club of global recognition. Yes. So, um, uh, it, it, and, and, and I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not, which is that um, he really is one of the, 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 the handful of public intellectuals who are absolutely essential reading and are recognized around the world. Now, the book that um, we're going to talk about a bit amongst his many uh, works is, is this, which I urge you to uh, buy afterwards. He'll be signing copies, so don't miss out. Uh, it's called Arguing with Zombies, and it's a collection of uh, his writings, primarily since 2004. Um, and I suppose, Paul, what I want to start by asking is, uh, you know, just to define terms. You know, what is a zombie idea, and how do they manage to keep stalking the world un okay. un 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 unstopped? See, so a zombie idea, I actually stole the term from an obscure paper about Canadian healthcare, of all things. But anyway, the, uh, well, we uh, a, a zombie idea is an idea that is, should be dead, because it's been proved wrong by experience, by logic, it, it's, it, we know that it's not true, but it refuses to die. It just keeps on shambling along, eating people's brains. Um, and un unfortunately, a very large part of our political policy debate is really um, shaped by the attempt to somehow stop these zombie ideas, which keep on dominating, uh, dominating our politics, dominating our policy. So that's, that's a zombie. I mean, if we can get later, and there, there's a small technical distinction between zombie ideas and cockroach ideas, which is another thing, but anyway. Well, you know, we will get to that very important distinction. Um, what, what that leads to inevitably is why zombie ideas, which as you describe in many cases in the book, have been you know, absolutely undermined by any evidence-based scientific or economic um, analysis, continue to stalk. I mean, what, what, what is propping them up? Okay. Um, usually, the answer is money. Uh, there are some other things involved as well. But so, in the U.S., the most persistent, pervasive zombie idea is the idea that cutting taxes on rich people pays for itself, that it yields the ma magical economic results, and and uh, and the revenue comes flooding in. Um, has the never the happened. The much abused Laffer curve. Oh. Yeah, uh, and we, you know, we've been through this now. We, there are many, many. Uh, tests of it, it's always failed. So why does anybody support this idea? And the answer is, well, a uh, famous quote from Upton Sinclair, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, um, we have a whole network of think tanks, uh, uh, journalistic outlets, uh, professional hacks, basically, uh, who are, well, you know, any, any, anything that, that uh, any idea that would lead to 
billionaires having even more money is going to be lavishly funded. It doesn't take a whole lot of support from a handful of wealthy people to keep something like that alive. And so that's, that's where it is. Um, uh, climate change. The mo if if uh, you know, the magic of tax cuts is, is the most pervasive zombie in, in the US political scene, um, the denial of climate change or the denial that we can do anything about it is the most consequential. In fact, it's the one that may destroy us all. Um, and that, if you ask me what percentage of the people who are climate change skeptics, uh, what percentage of the uh, people who claim to have contrary evidence or claim to produce economic results uh, that, that say that it's impossible to stop it, um, what percentage of them are basically working, employed by the fossil fuel industry? The answer is 100. Right. Every, they're, 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 it's, it's, it's an entirely a, corrupt enterprise. It's a slam dunk. I mean, another, one of those ideas that, that you deal with in the book uh, and has ob obvious relevance here as well is, is austerity. That's right. Which, um, it's hard to exaggerate the extent to which it was orthodox in this country, as elsewhere, to argue that after the crash, deficit reduction was absolutely essential to economic recovery and uh, that without it, the British economy, for instance, would, would, would end up in a disastrous place. Now, why was that wrong? And, and, and how did it come about that that was so pervasive an idea? Okay, it, the reason it was wrong, and, f and we've actually now um, I mean, it was never the case that there was a consensus among economists that, that debt was uh, a really severe issue. Um, but there were some, but what's happened now at this point, uh, even the most utterly mainstream economists, uh, people like Olivier Manchard, of the, formerly of the IMF, or Larry Summers, are, are saying the same things I've been saying all along, which is that debt is a grossly exaggerated issue. And the reason it's grossly exaggerated is that Advanced countries have the ability to borrow a lot as long as they borrow on their own currency. And if you actually ask, uh, you know, will we have a debt spiral where interest rates mount and that means even more debt, the arithmetic says no. Um, right now, Britain can borrow at an interest rate, long term, an interest rate of less than 1%. The British economy has inflation that's more than that and plus some economic growth. So in fact, even if, uh, the interest payments on the debt are not enough to cause a debt spiral. If, if the British government just keeps the deficit, uh, it, can, it can even run a budget deficit and still have the debt steadily melt away as a share of GDP. So the, the arithmetic just says it's not right. It, and it never was right. It never made any sense. Um, the, now, this is one where it's a little bit, it's a little less crude and crass than climate change or, or tax cuts. Uh, there are some money issues, but I think the, the biggest problem, I have a, a whole section on, on this stuff, uh, which is titled Very Serious People. Yes. Uh, which is a term I stole, again, from someone, uh, someone else. But the very serious people are people who say things that sound very serious. And they sound very serious because that's what lots of other very serious people do. And they, it sounds like it's an important, tough, thing to, uh, you know, of course, we must get our fiscal house in order. And um, it, it's very difficult to get people off that notion um, because that's kind of the sociology of how, how do you prove that you're a responsible, tough-minded person by taking what sounds like a serious position, which austerity sounded like, although it was in fact disastrous. You note as well in one of the chapters of the book that um, one of the uh, essays was printed in the book columns that the right is uh, quite um, nimble, let's say, on deficit. Oh. When it suits it to chase debt, it, 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 it's quite happy to rack it up. Oh, that's right. The, the, uh, the whole story of the U.S., uh, of political economy in the U.S., has been that uh, as long as there was a Democrat in the White House, Republicans said that debt is an existential threat, that we must cut spending, and they had enough power to force a, quite a bit of austerity in the United States, which definitely hobbled the economic recovery. The moment literally the moment there was a Republican in the White House, debt, nobody cares about debt. Uh, and uh, so they were, suddenly we, they, they blow up the deficit to a trillion dollars. And um, so that was very strategic. The, so there was, from the point of view of the right, yes, uh, debt panic was simply a way to, to prevent Democrats from actually doing anything, to prevent progressives from pursuing any, any goals. But then there were a lot of other people who were not especially uh, part of that who just bought into it because it sounded serious. And also, 
were amazingly gullible, were willing to believe in the seriousness of, of Republicans like Paul Ryan, the former Speaker of the House, who were obvious phonies. Um, and uh, so that's how that, that whole thing happened. Another example is um, the skills gap. Now, I can't remember an administration on either side of the Atlantic that has not claimed there was a skills gap. Yeah. But you, you, you pretty much show in the book that this is not the reason for most of the pathologies it's blamed for. Well, in 2014, everybody who mattered was said that the reason that we have high unemployment is that workers don't have the appropriate skills. We, have a, we lack the right mix of workers to deal with the 21st century economy. Um, and here we are, it's 2020, and the U.S. has 3.5% unemployment, and the workers have not gotten more skilled in that time. It was all, it was never, there was never any evidence for this. But again, it, it sounds serious. And by the way, this is, this is a recurring thing. If you go back to the 1930s, you will find a lot of people saying, oh, you know, this modern technological, this 20, 20th century technological economy requires skills that workers don't have. And the idea that, that you can restore full employment with something like this, this crazy person John Maynard Keynes says, by, by having government spending is, is, is insane. Obviously, it's, it's a problem of technology and skills. And then along came a very large fiscal stimulus, otherwise known as World War II. And, um, and all of a sudden, we had full employment all yeah. across the Western world. Now, are we therefore, I mean, is this a, is this a fair uh, conclusion to draw from what you just said? Is the panic around automation, which is in, on yeah, every magazine cover, too great or just uh, wrongly targeted? Oh, that's a, that's a weird one. And that's another one I think we're, let me say, so the basic idea of Keynesian economics at a sort of cosmic level is that, is that often the economy is depressed uh, for reasons that are not deep. There just is not enough spending for whatever reason. You just don't have enough demand out there and you can restore full employment by just creating more demand. Uh, um, Keynes had this great essay in 1930 uh, where, uh, about the coming, the, the Great Depression, which was un unfolding, and he said, you know, we, um, there's nothing wrong with the car, there's nothing wrong with the engine, we have magneto trouble, which you know, this little, I get more or less the alternator, um, that it's this tiny little, and it's, just, it's a small technical problem with vast consequences. People find that really hard to accept. The idea that something like mass unemployment, something like what the world looked like uh, in 2010, 2011, could be something that required just a technical fix, just let's go out there and spend some money and get people back to work, is I think offends a lot of people's sensibility. They think that large problems must have large causes mm -hmm. and they can't be such an easy solution. And so there's always this tendency to say that must be something big, it must be that robots are taking away all the jobs. Um, but first of all, we've been there before. It's been, this has been a complaint many, many times. Uh, and uh, if robots were doing all the work, so we don't need workers, then the workers remaining ought to have very high productivity. And what we actually have, even in my country and even more here, you have uh, the, the lowest productivity growth we've seen in generations. So the, the robot story is just not, the technological unemployment story is just completely at odds with, with the data. Um, if I can, I'm gonna go on a bit on this. I think part of the point is that um, we've had big things of automation before. Uh, big cases where particular types of jobs are eliminated by technology. But in the past, they've tended to be blue collar jobs. Mm. And, um, and people like us don't notice that. So New York, I live in New York, New York used to have hundreds of thousands of longshoremen. Now they're all gone. There's a, 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 a couple of dozen gigantic cranes over in Elizabeth, New Jersey that do the work that those 200,000 longshoremen used to do. That's a huge technological displacement. Of course, other jobs materialized, but it didn't make a big impact. But a lot of what we see now is we see uh, computer translation, computer, uh, so we see AI, machine learning. We, we see uh, high tech stuff which affects high skilled people whom we might actually know. Yeah. And so we, we make a big deal of it. But the fact of the matter is it's not, the actual amount of displacement going on now is actually much less than happened to lots of ordinary workers in the past. Do you think it will, uh, automation, I mean, will it change the nature of work, notwithstanding your point about the, the, the totals, will it change the nature of work? 
significantly? Well, or is that just something that happens anyway? That happens anyway. I mean, if uh, we, we look at the, uh, oh, the, the, in the U.S., sorry, most of my, I know my numbers for the U.S. So, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, so if you look at the 10 fastest growing occupations in the U.S., eight of them are basically some kind of nursing. Right, so if we actually look, where, where are the jobs? A lot of it is health care, a lot of it is personal care, it's, uh, um, and, which is fine. Those are real jobs, and in fact, they happen to be jobs that, uh, at least for now and probably for some time to come, we can't actually have done by robots. So nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, yes, I mean, there are a lot fewer people making stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that's happened before as well. I mean, we used to have, um, uh, you know, most people were farmers, uh, and these days uh, the, we actually no longer even keep a number on the number of farmers in the U.S. because there are so few, but we know that there are fewer people farming than there are people playing World of Warcraft. So, um, it's a, <laughs> um, it, you know, so that's just sort of, but we found other stuff to do. And so manufacturing is, uh, is now something like 8% of the workforce, uh, not because, mostly because we're just, we're just so good at it. We don't need a lot of people to do it, but there are lots of other things to do, and we haven't at all run out of things for people to do. So and, but my point here is I think that blaming automation, putting the blame for lagging economic performance, lagging wages on automation is not only, you know, it's wrong, but it's also, it's a dodge, it's an escape. Mm. Because what's really going on, if you wanna ask, you know, why have workers done so badly, it ultimately comes down mainly to issues of power. It has to do with the, the crushing of the union movement in the United States. It has wage stagnation with, because of yeah. lack of collective power. Lack of collective bargaining is because minimum wage lagging far, far behind productivity. So the, it, what we're doing, it's an out for a lot of people saying, oh, it's all these impersonal forces and technology and what can you do is a way to avoid facing up to the, uh, the political decisions that have actually caused us to be where we are. So inevitably one wants to talk about Trump and what's interesting in the book is your consistent contention that Trump is not a singular uh, phenomenon in the sense that and you say it's something like Trump was coming which is a very very important yeah. proposal now can, can you elaborate on that because well okay so the big news and you know, big story for America right now is we, we're gonna have the, the latest budget uh, and uh, uh, the budgets in the U.S., given our system, are not what actually happens, but they are kind of a statement of, uh, of, uh, of intentions. And it's, uh, it's going to include um, big tax cuts for the rich and block granting of health care for lots of people that will lead to large cuts relative to current law and cuts in uh, programs. And you ask, when, when did we first start seeing proposals like that? The answer is the 1990s. The Trump 2020 budget is almost identical uh, in the broad picture to Newt Gingrich's contract with America from 1995. Um, the Republican Party has been moving in this direction. It used to be, for a long time, there were still some holdover, long-serving long senators who came from an earlier era when the, it wasn't so extreme. But we've been heading in this direction uh, for quite some time. I think it just... Uh, uh, may have happened a little bit sooner than we might have thought, but, but the, this was really going to, um, th this, this movement towards a, 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 this kind of alliance between the plutocrats and, and the, uh, and, and the uh, uh, white nationalists is something that, that's been building for decades. Can you explain what you mean by movement conservatism? Because it's yeah. a very important idea in the book. Yeah. So this is, and it's not, there's nothing quite like it in any of the other, uh, in any other country. It's not, UK I, I don't believe is anything comparable, though you may be heading that way. But um, if, if the, in the United States, so we have two political parties and the, the press likes to treat them as being equivalent. And even aside from the question of which you think is right and which you think is wrong, they're just very different animals. The Democratic Party is a, is a loose coalition of, of, of interest groups, labor unions such as they are, civil rights advocates, uh, lawyers actually, it turns out, uh, environmentalists, you know, a bunch of, of uh, who, who usually manage to act more or less together. The Republican Party is a very hierarchical structure, or it's actually a piece of a very hierarchical structure, which includes the Murdoch media empire, um, 
uh, Fox News is enormously important in the US. Uh, it includes um, a whole network of think tanks, which are not actually think tanks, but are actually propaganda institutions. Um, it includes lobbying groups, all of which are very tightly controlled, um, and they uh, push a consistent line. So, you know, if, if your uh, idea is that, that there's kind of a daily memo that goes out to, to, that tells Fox News uh, uh, anchors uh, what, which, which smear they should perpetrate and that that memo also goes out to, to staffers in Congress on the Republican side, yeah, that's exactly what happens. Mm. Uh, it, it really is a coordinated thing. And it's, 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 a, um, it's all embracing. It, it, it's, uh, you be, at this point, almost everybody left in US politics on the right has grown up within that system. This is where they made their career. This is the safety net. If they should happen to lose uh, a re-election bid, there are jobs waiting at lobbying firms and think tanks for them. We actually have a term for that. We call it wingnut welfare. Um, there's a, uh, uh, and if, sh if they should happen to, to deviate from the party line, then you know, terrible things will happen. Uh, watch, witness, uh, uh, you know, we're watching now uh, 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 Mitt Romney being described as a socialist because yes. he was the one, the only Republican senator who voted to convict Trump. So uh, who, um, who knew, including and, Mitt, I suspect. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and which is kind of a, a, quite amazing, actually, uh, if you think about about where he came from. I mean, this is the guy who, who said, corporations are people, my friend. Uh, yeah. But uh, because he, what, he didn't obey the, the Trump line, he's, he's, he's uh, a Marxist. He's a Marxist. So, um, and, but that's really important. You, you need to understand that this is not the case. It, there, it, it, it doesn't really matter uh, uh, what the personal uh, um, affect or the, the language used by a particular Republican senator is. It doesn't really matter. They, this is a machine. This is a, sort of, in a, in a way, the ultimate in machine politics. And it's a very, very um, a, a powerful force. If you don't understand that, then you, you completely miss what's actually going on in, in the political scene. Because it's interesting, because there's a narrative that somehow Trump has subdued the Republican Party. Um, you know, they saw him coming down the the famous golden escalator in June 2015. They laughed at him, and now he has tamed them. But, but you get, I get the feeling that you think that really uh, it wasn't an act of colonization at all. It was a, it was a perfect, perfectly consensual relationship. I mean, they thought he was going to lose. Yeah. They thought he would be such an outrage that, that the scandals and the, and the just implausibility of yeah. this guy as president. So they, were, they opposed him because they thought he was going to lose. Uh, and maybe, I mean, he talked. Uh, a moderate game on policy in 2016. He said, I'm going to raise taxes on rich people and I'm going to maintain the, the, the social safety net programs. Uh, and they, some of them may have worried that he actually meant it. But in practice, he's been absolutely an orthodox Republican. In practice, he, so it, it, it's, I, actually that's column uh, for tomorrow's newspaper. So it's, it's, you could say that, that Trump uh, took over the GOP, but you could equally well say that the GOP took over Trump, that he has, he has become, basically it's a deal. He will do exactly the same policy agenda that they wanted, and in return they will run cover for his corruption and, and, and abuse of power. Is he, uh, you mentioned in a couple of places that machismo forms a very important, a sort yeah. of very, very debased machismo, that you know, this is a guy who wants to build a wall. Yeah. And, and, how much do you think that animated his hatred of Obamacare? Well, okay, I think he had hatred of Obama in general. I think yeah. at, at some level... Anything and, Obama did was bad. Anything Obama did was bad. So it, it's, uh, it, and that's part, you know, you can, there are many reasons. He's, 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 a, he's a good hater, but the, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, no, I think, I, I think actually the, the hatred of Obamacare is, is actually, which is you know, spread across the Republican Party. And that, that really comes down to two things. One is the way it's paid for, so, which is the actual revenue stream that backs the subsidies that make Obamacare work it is, a, is a tax on high incomes. So it, it, uh, Obama raised taxes on, on, on high income, on the, on the 1% more than, than many people realize. And a lot of that was because of the financing of Obamacare. But the other thing is the great 
right-wing fear about Obamacare, which I think has been somewhat vindicated, is that it might work. Um, because if you actually demonstrate that the government can do something good for people, mm. if they can do something good on one front, then maybe we should be doing good things on other fronts. And, uh, yes. and so they, they don't want, a, they want this to it fail. It was a, a test of a dangerous the theory. Yeah. I mean, this was actually, uh, you go back uh, when the Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton health care reform failed. They, a lot of Republicans were quite explicit, saying we must not allow this to succeed because it will empower advocates of a more expansive role for government. And so the same thing. And uh, Obamacare, in, in the end, I mean, they, uh, uh, well, there's no end, but uh, the 2018 midterm elections were largely a, a Democratic victory because people were so upset that, that uh, Republicans were trying to take away what they yeah. had gained under Obamacare. You, there's, there's a wonderful... Um, passage, I hope you don't mind me quoting, it's from an October 2018 column, and you say, Trump has an advantage. He didn't grow up in the conservative hothouse. His very crudity means that he understands that his electoral chances depend not on repeating conservative pieties, but on maximum ugliness. It's, it's a brilliant piece of writing, but tell, tell us what you mean by maximum ugliness. Oh, I mean, the um, you know, uh, locker up, uh, racist, uh, pretty explicitly racist remarks, uh, uh, insulting, it just, it, it, one of the things you see uh, in, I mean, most Republican members of Congress are apparatchiks. They've grown up inside this, this hot house, and they actually fairly often, they, they repeat the, the sacred phrases um, of their movement uh, under the impression that they mean something to ordinary people. <laughs> And uh, what they don't, I mean, so when, when they say, oh, you know, peons to free enterprise, uh, the public doesn't care about that one way or the other. No. Uh, there was a famous moment, the, the um, uh, Eric Cantor, who was a rising star within the Republican Party, was the number two person uh, or number three person in Congress, uh, uh, and was defeated in a primary challenge by a, somebody who was more Trumpy than he was. But he, um, uh, but on Labor Day, in the United States, you know, we, uh, we don't celebrate May Day, we have a different Labor Day, um, but he put out a, a, a memo celebrating people who've built businesses. Just, that's, that's the way Republicans talk, they don't value workers actually, yeah. but he forgot that you know, most people are not business owners and, and so had lost the ability to talk to ordinary people because he'd been so much a creature of this, this inward looking hermetic world of, of movement conservatism. And Trump is not. Trump. Uh, he says the quiet parts out loud, is quite explicit in his appeals to, uh, to, to racial fears, and uh, mostly racial fears, but other things as well. And, um, and that's, that's an advantage. I mean, uh, Mitt Romney, who has surprised us all by showing some principles, uh, part of his problem in 2012 was that he, was, he came across as aloof and, and uh, a, a, a rich guy who didn't care about ordinary people. And, um, which he probably is, but Trump is a rich guy, not as rich as he says, but still, who <laughs> clearly who doesn't care about people in general, but he does channel the, the anger, the hate uh, the, that, that a lot of the base feels. I mean, it, it, one of the most interesting things you chase is, is this very central role that culture and identity and white nationalism plays in the moment. Yeah. And to the extent that you say, you know, racial, Resentment is now more important than economic distress as a as a as a as a motivator. Now this is a it's fascinating from an economist, but b it's extremely alarming to to hear. Now, what is that a change? Was was that germinating? It's when building. Um, uh, it it used to be the case uh, that I mean the the rise of conservatism conservative politics in the United States, um, up until maybe 10 years ago, was entirely because Southern white voters switched parties, all of it. It was entirely the, the, that after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, Republicans, uh, uh, Southern whites became Republicans. Now, that extends to some extent to working class whites in, in Northern states as well. But it's, um, and, but if you look at, uh, God, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a uh, academic uh, 
who does who thinks in terms of graphs and, and, and uh, statistics and so on, and then tries to imitate a, an actual human being. But the uh, um, but if you if you graph income versus political alignment, which you can do in the United mm. States, uh, and it's it's it is true that the richer people are, the more Republican they tend to be. Although the more educated they are, the more democratic they tend to be. But but if you look at that at the groups that um, are off the line, that are either very di that are very different from where you would predict given their income, um, there are a couple of groups that stand out. Um, uh, uh, African Americans are even more democratic. They're relatively poor, but they're even more democratic than you would expect because they understand what's going on. Um, Southern whites are equally extremely Republican in the opposite direction. They're relatively poor, but they're very, very Republican. Um, and then a few other groups. Uh, it turns out that uh, the Jews are far more liberal uh, than, uh, than you would expect given their income, um, um, and, uh, which I will say is because, uh, I, now I can speak from, you know, that, that, is, my, that is my tribe, um, and uh, because we always know that once prejudice and hate start spreading, we're always next in line. Um, and, the, um, and what's interesting now is Asian Americans have moved the same way. They have figured it out as well, that, that uh, even if they're affluent in the end, they're, they're not gonna be considered real Americans if, if this stuff happens. And so you, it's just transparently obvious from voting patterns, from everything that, that, that race uh, is, is central. And look, the white nationalism has always been there. Mm. But what's happened now is that the, all of the restraints, all of the, a lot of the, if you like, you know, hypocrisy is the tribute uh, vice pays to virtue. There, mm. People used to be hypocritical and, and, and tone down the racism and um, not anymore. So, I mean, just to be clear, you give Trump some agency in this because a moment like Charlottesville, where he talks about very fine people yeah. on both sides, that has to play into the permissive environment you're talking about. Of course. Yes. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, it, it's possible had, had things turned out to be, a, had some more conventional Republican uh, uh, won, they might have, uh, I think in many ways the same things would have happened, and eventually a Trump-like character was going to come. Yeah. But it might have been delayed a bit. I mean, if you go back, you know, it's, one of the things I say is each, in the United States, each successive Republican president has managed to make his predecessor look good. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> I, I was not a fan of George W. Bush, to say no, the that's, least. That's true. But one well. thing you will say is that after 9-11, he was pretty, he really made an effort to say, this does not mean that everybody Muslim is bad. No, he this does not mean that every Arab American yeah. is bad. He, he did, in fact, take a stand uh, against uh, an outbreak of, of sheer hatred, and Trump, of course, does the opposite. Trump, they, you know, he, it, there's this imaginary crime wave by, by undocumented immigrants in the United States. It's not happening. Mm. It, it, it actually doesn't happen at all, but, in, but Trump insists that it's happening, even though it isn't. Well, that, that brings us neatly to the question of the truth. And you, again, you, I think one of the most interesting right. themes of the book is this notion of um, climate change denial as, and you call it the, the crucible of Trumpism. Um, you know, as it were, you say that it's the application of the depravity of climate denial to every aspect of politics. And that's a very, very interesting uh, way of looking at Trumpism. Yeah, I think about it. I don't know how much people have followed the history here, but the, uh, you know, as the climate change became unambiguous, which really is, it, it has, is now, we, uh, it, it really became undeniable 20 years ago, but, uh, but that didn't stop people from denying. And if you look at the various pieces of it, it became widespread view on the right that there, it was a hoax concocted by a gigantic international conspiracy of scientists which is, you know, the Trump conspiracy theor theorizing, the, the QAnon, uh, the, uh, 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 some, some random pizza shop is, is, uh, is a place where, where Democrats uh, engage in, in, uh, in, in child abuse or yeah. that sort of, this, 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 the craziness, the, the wild conspiracy theorizing um, was already sort of standard practice on climate. The uh, abuse of power, I mean, the, uh, um, 
the uh, Attorney General of Virginia, who is now at Homeland Security, I believe, uh, going after immigrants, but he spent years on a crusade trying to um, basically criminalize climate, climate science, and particularly going after Michael Mann, who's the famous hockey stick on global temperatures, uh, trying to uh, not just, not just you know, denounce him, but actually try to basically put this guy in jail for doing science. So all of the things that we're now seeing on a much broader front were present years ago on the climate issue. And of course, in, in, in climate change, the, the, de the public debate was put back a long way by the continued insistence that, that there, was, there was doubt. That right. all, you referred at the beginning to you know, the, 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 the money that's poured into maintaining right. doubt in these issues. That was surely extremely important in that debate. Yeah, if you actually, so this has been, uh, people, uh, Naomi Oreskes, I think mostly did, uh, um, look at art, that handful, uh, of, I think of, of articles in professional scientific journals that touch on climate change, 3% uh, express some doubt about the phenomenon. Um, and uh, of those, if you then look at the, at the s sources of financial support for the authors of those skeptical articles, how many of them have basically been supported by fossil fuel interests? And the answer is all of them. Yeah. It's a, a, the, the appearance that there are two sides to this story is entirely manufactured by... Which is an analog with what happened in the 50s with um, the tobacco industry. That's right. We've been through this on tobacco. We've been through this on acid rain. Uh, it's, uh, but of course, um, tobacco is bad, uh, but, and, uh, and local air pollution is bad, but, uh, but climate change is, is an existential threat to civilization, and still this happens. You say it's very important when necessary, and then only when necessary, to call out uh, yeah. people of bad faith and bad motive. Uh, isn't that etched a, a sort of implicit critique of the media for, for what you might call bogus impartiality, oh, you know, it's bogus equivalents. Oh, it's not actually implicit, it's quite it's there. explicit. Yeah. I, I, no, I, I wrote way back in 2000 uh, uh, during, again, if we, we forget just how much Bush lied about, mm. about his policies. Now, it's not quite on a Trumpian scale, but it was still pretty uh, awesome. Um, and you could not get journalists to report that. Um, and I, I said at the time that if, if a candidate said that the, that the Earth was flat, the newspaper headline would, would read, views differ on shape of planet, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and that is still, uh, it's less true now than it was, but it's still a very powerful force and, and has allowed this stuff to flourish. Um, and uh, I, I can't, I, I hold zero sway, maybe negative sway with, with, with the, uh, news reporting side of the New York Times, but I at least am not going to make that pretense. I'm not going to, when, when, uh, when one side is not only wrong, but clearly, deliberately lying, I'm going to say that. It reminds me of my favorite tweet of all time, which was the American Flat Earth Society tweeting that flat earth beliefs are going global. <laughs> ah, I, which I hadn't seen that. <laughs> was uh, uh, only a semi-successful tweet. Um, on, 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 last question on Trump, it, it is a very simple one, really, which is, um, I know that given your position with the New York Times, you can't endorse a candidate, but you surely um, have a view on whether the Democrats can win. I mean, and if so, what, what strategy do they have to adopt in November? Okay, well, I think the Democrats can win. Um, they have to run against a fairly strong economy. And uh, they also have to run, um, they need to get their act together, quite literally. They, uh, um, there's a lot of squabbling within the Democratic Party right now. Some of it, uh, you know, of course, people can have differences of views, but I sure as hell hope that they um, unite behind whoever the candidate mm -hmm. is. Uh, the, um, there, and I'm not sure they will. There, there are some, um, there, you know, the Bernie bro thing is real. Mm -hmm. There are uh, there are a significant number of people who are associated with the Bernie Sanders campaign who uh, refused to back Hillary Clinton after she got the nomination in 2016, saying there was no difference between Clinton and Trump. And those people don't seem to be chastened by what has happened since. Um, and there are some, particularly sort of business-oriented Democrats, 
uh, who say, well, they will bolt the party if Sanders is the nominee, mm. which is equally uh, unforgivable. Um, the stakes are just too high. And so, uh, but the Democrats should run. Um, I mean, I understand that uh, people have very ambitious things, would like to make really major progressive changes in policy, um, but that's not going to win the election. The election is going to be won by convincing people um, of the truth, which is that if Trump is reelected, there will be huge cuts in, in government programs that people depend on. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you want to say, uh, I would like to have a Medicare type system for everybody, okay, but in fact, the mo much more important as an electoral thing is to say, Trump will actually destroy Medicaid yeah. and severely cut Medicare if he's reelected. Don't, so let, don't you, let the you need perfect to, be any of the good. Yeah, you need, you need to emphasize that the extent to which actually the Republicans are the radicals here and how much the programs you depend on are at risk if, the, if, if Trump wins. Turning to this country and its problems, um, you, yeah. you come here only a few days after Brexit. Yeah. What's your feeling on the, the prospects uh, for the UK after Brexit? Do you have a sense? Yeah, so I've been, I'm an interesting, I'm, I'm certainly think that Brexit was a bad idea and it will make Britain poorer. Um, and if uh, you haven't actually done the, 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 the physical, there, there's a possibility that the, uh, that there will be a, a significant disruption in the short run. In the long run, it will make Britain a little bit poorer. Uh, you know, uh, two or three percent of GDP, which is... You know, Fair amount. This, well, yeah, this two or three percent with the error range being that wide, yeah. right? It's, it, it's a very difficult thing to estimate, but it imposes a lot of frictions. You know, the, the great thing that the European Union managed to do was to create a, a truly frictionless flow of goods and services and people comparable to what we have within the United States, and Brexit does away with that, and, and that creates a lot of uh, additional costs, but not catastrophe. I mean, uh, um, uh, suppose, for example, that Britain negotiates a free trade agreement. But not, but not part of the EU, which means it's free trade, but not a customs union, which in turn means that you actually have to have border checks and yeah. posts and so on. So that introduces some frictions. Well, Canada has a free trade agreement with the United States, but not a customs union. So you do have to stop at the border, and, uh, there are, and it's a nuisance, and it does impose some costs. And Canada is no doubt a little bit poorer than it would be if it were simply a part of a customs union. But on the other hand, it's not a... You know, uh, uh, Canada is not is, is not a, a hellhole of, of economic depression. It, it 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 manages. So I think that's the the uh, Brexit is is a bad idea. I I don't like the p political process that got you there. And that's what well, I was going to say. It, 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 does it have un unpleasant echoes to you as a symptom of something? Well, yeah, a lot of they're, they're clearly echoes. Now I think it's not nearly as bad here as it is in the states. Although I might be proved wrong about that. Um, but, uh, but it clearly has some of the echoes. And there, there, some of the, there are a lot of commonalities. I mean, and, and um, I will, so I'm much more disturbed maybe about the, what Brexit may say about the future politics of the UK than, than about the economics. The economics, in the end, you know, money is just money. And, it's, uh, it, and making the country a couple of percent poorer is that's a, that's a pretty big thing in terms of what policy could achieve. That's a, that's a pretty impressive level of economic destruction, but it's, it's actually not going to be the, the fundamental thing. I mean, one of, one of the prospective symmetries, you talk, you talk often in the book about how Trump made big promises to the yeah. left behind and, in fact, delivered a pretty s standard Republican yeah. um, package. Um, Boris Johnson is promising huge infrastructure and regeneration. Yeah packages, um, one wonders where that will go. We'll see. I mean... Uh, but he's also asking for big cuts. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I have no insight. I mean, uh, the, uh, I, the thing about Trump is you might have thought that he would try to deliver at least a little bit of what he promised. <laughs> and, uh, and his absolute, complete abandonment of all of that is is impressive and not very smart. And I, I suspect... Or does it terrify you? In the sense that, that has there been, is there a risk of complete detachment in the political process between evidence and emotion? Well, that's what's happening anyway. Yeah. But no. But I actually do think that. Uh, look, um, 
the, the comparisons I think about it, it's not with the UK because I don't know what's going to happen here, but um, I was paying for complicated reasons. I was uh, paying surprisingly close attention to developments in Eastern Europe. I was uh, a, a good friend who was a constitutional law person, was tracking the collapse of democracy in Hungary. And the thing about Hungary, the Fidesz, uh, mm. preserving the outward forms of democracy, but in fact creating a one-party autocracy, was that Viktor Orban is smart. And he actually delivered a little bit there was some genuine populism mi mixed in with the authoritarianism. Um, and if Trump had, were as smart and, and self-disciplined as Orban, we'd be lost uh, in America already. It's a, I mean, in some ways, we, we were given a gift by the fact that we had such a, a, a sloppy, undisciplined authoritarian. Yes. I mean, you say, you <laughs> well, you know, small mercies. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you sort of identify a, a quadrant that's under-occupied at the moment, but could be, which is the economically interventionist and socially conservative. That's you right. Know, uh, the sort of George Wallace type of guy. And um, which is, by the way, where to some extent Orban is in, in, yeah. a little bit uh, in, in Hungary. It's a little bit what uh, law and justice is doing in Poland. They, there, it's uh, actually the, the phrase that uh, political scientists I know use sometimes, they, they call it a heron folk uh, welfare state. Yeah. Uh, a welfare state, but only for the master race, yeah, right? And, yeah. um, and there's, uh, the FN in, in France is a little bit like that as well. And that, that's a very, it, it, what's, it's actually interesting in America that the hold of the plutocrats over the, over the Republican Party is so strong that we have nobody moving into that space. Uh, and, uh, um, but yeah, they're, they're clearly, you would think there would be a political opportunity for somebody to be, you know, uh, actually, <laughs> random thought, the, uh, very, very early, uh, there was, um, the, at the very beginning in, in the history of South Africa, um, the, 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 uh, briefly, the slogan of the uh, South African Communist Party was, workers of the world unite for a white South Africa. Right? Uh, there is a, uh, there, there, there is, there is a, uh, you know, there is a, a, an opportunity like that. And uh, um, I, guess, I guess we can consider ourselves fortunate that, that no US politician has moved into that space. Yeah, yet. Um, my final question for me before we turn to the audience is um, you survey all of this and you survey in the book uh, a whole issue, a range of issues over 15 years. Here we are in 2020. Are you, would you consider yourself broadly an optimist or broadly a pessimist? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, that is... I mean, I'm, I'm terrified about the political near term. Yeah. Uh, now, if I step back, if we get the... Two things. Um, uh, in terms of, of social attitudes, um, despite all of these things we're talking about, despite the empowerment of white nationalism and intolerance and all of that, the underlying um, social attitudes have gotten much more progressive. I mean, when, I, uh, when Ronald Reagan was elected, only one in three white Americans thought that interracial marriage was okay. Yeah. Um, see, you watch issues like gay marriage went from a, you know, a deadly political issue in 2004 to widespread approval now. And so you see these changes. Uh, so the, we're still, there's still lots of racism, there's still lots of intolerance, and it's enough to unfortunately sometimes be decisive politically, but we're actually much less racist and much more tolerant than we were, which is a hopeful sign if we can get through this moment without seeing democracy collapse. Um, and then on the most important issue, which is climate change, uh, there, um, Technology is our friend. I mean, we've actually had a, uh, I say, you know, the claims of robots and all of that and incredible technological change are, are all wrong. But one area where there has been revolutionary technological change is energy. Um, the, the idea of a, of a society that lives basically on renewable energy and has virtually no greenhouse gas emissions, that looked like a very steep hill to climb 10 years ago, now looks relatively easy. We've, we've had miraculous progress there. So the saving the planet is technologically easy. Uh, saving society, underlying attitudes have been moving in a direction of greater tolerance, but we are at a moment of crisis where we can lose it all, uh, and we could lose it all very soon. Okay, a good moment to hand over to the audience. Now, we have, um, 
uh, microphone uh, queuing system here. Um, where are they? They are one there. And is there another one on the balcony? Yeah. We yes. Okay. Uh, so please come up uh, one at a time. I mean, two, you can queue, obviously. Um, and please be as uh, short and brief in your question as possible. And don't make speeches. Otherwise, I shall cut you off ruthlessly. Right. Fire away. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I was interested in your thoughts about the concept that uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about in his podcast um, on um, revisionist history. He introduced the notion of moral licensing and looks at how after, for example, Australia had elected their first prime minister who was a woman, there was rampant sexism. How after the election of Barack Obama, there was rampant racism. and. Uh, describes a sociological phenomenon whereby people feel licensed to express this um, really re uh, extreme views of intolerance after having come through a period of relative uh, progressive uh, development. I'd like to get your thoughts on that, whether you yeah. think that has currency. And if you could speak to how our own media are becoming so tailored to our specific propensities, whether they be tolerant or intolerant, how it's very possible to have that be routinized uh, in the way we think about the world we live in. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Um, so I haven't listened to Mark. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say this, since we're, we're peddling some podcasts of me uh, this week. But um, uh, I actually theory. don't do we'll, we'll gain. Uh, but the, um, uh, I mean, there is certainly something in that. It was clear that, that it, Perversely, I mean, a lot of people thought that the election of Barack Obama went, meant that we really had transcended racism, and uh, in fact, it seems to have been like uh, a significant number of people, having voted for one black person, now felt uh, uh, free to be to be much more racist thereafter. Um, um, although that is not what I actually think is more important in terms of this outburst of the the crudest emotions is that um, the we used to be held together. Uh, the, the really raw racism, raw white nationalism, a lot of other things were held back by the fact that, that there was a, an elite that, that considered such things unacceptable and, uh, and people listened to the elite. And I believe that the financial crisis, the euro crisis, the demonstration that the, the elite in many cases had no idea what it was doing uh, undermined its authority and in, in, in that way opened the door for a lot of stuff. I don't, I don't, th 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 um, Poland, sorry, weird, good job. Poland actually escaped largely unscathed through the Euro crisis, uh, didn't, wasn't badly hit by the financial crisis. Why have white nationalists taken over in Poland? And I think a lot of it is that the European elite that used to have the moral authority to say you can't do that uh, no longer commands credibility anywhere in, in Europe. Yes, go right ahead. Hi. I love your column. Um, I'm an American medical student. I'm here doing um, an elective in the UK. Um, and you were talking about how um, the US economy, so many of the jobs are healthcare related. And if by any miracle we get any sort of substantive healthcare reform passed in the US, I'm wondering what would happen to our economy. And also, if you can talk about some of the challenges face facing the NHS. OK. Uh, that's a question, actually, that um, I've been asked a couple of times on tour. It's a good question. Um, we spent 18% of GDP on health care. And you might say, oh my god, if, you know, that's clearly excessive. And, but if we cut it back, what happens to all the jobs? The answer I would give is that um, I won't say there's been nothing no negative impact. But if you actually look at it, it turns out that America spends far more on health care than anybody else does. But we don't actually get more health care than other countries do. It's all about high prices. Um, and those high prices are reflecting, uh, to some extent, high physician salaries, but not high nurses' salaries. Um, and a lot of it is, is, is exorbitant prices we pay for, for drugs and for medical equipment. Um, and the, so if, if we ask what would be squeezed if we get effective healthcare reform that brings costs down, I don't think it would mean 
a large reduction in the number of nurses because, in fact, the United States is not hugely oversupplied with nurses compared with other advanced countries. Uh, uh, we, we, we pay more for health care, but the extra payments are largely going to, to big pharma and the medical equipment manufacturers and, to some extent, to star doctors who are being paid very high salaries. Um, and the ordinary, it's the, the working stiffs of the medical industrial complex are not the ones who would, who would be hurt by, by a more rational health care system. So can I take the next question from the, the balcony? Hello. Um, I'm keen to get your thoughts on um, GDP as a measurement um, and whether it needs updating, whether it's still the best way to take the pulse of a nation. Okay, I can't actually see where the person is, but so let me respond to a gen in a general way to the, the vicinity. But the, um, all right. Um, look, nobody, no serious economist has ever said that GDP is the measure of an economy's success. Uh, every Principles of Economics textbook has, a, uh, has, has a, a box in it that says what GDP does not do. Uh, I know that for sure, because mine does, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, um, and so now, it's, to some extent, maybe, we still fall into the trap of thinking that, that GDP, you know, GDP is, is the market value of goods and services produced. And that doesn't count um, both, it doesn't count the negatives, doesn't, it, you know, if, if you produce a, uh, if you operate a, a, a dirty power plant in, in the middle of an urban area that kills a lot of people, you've added to GDP. And, uh, uh, and it doesn't count some of the good things that happen. So uh, if we look, um, I, I tend to use these days Denmark as an example of, of how different an advanced country can be from the United States. Uh, and in Denmark, it turns out Denmark has exactly the same productivity that the United States does. It has uh, just, uh, just as well at, at, at employment, or a little bit better, actually, at, at, in terms of worker employment. Uh, but its GDP per capita is something like 10% less. And the reason is because the Danes actually take vacations. Um, and that's clearly, that's, that's not a negative, right? So, so GDP is, um, a flawed measure but it, uh, of welfare, or it's not a measure of, of human welfare. But on the other hand, it's, uh, it is what it is. We know what it means. And if you want, it's perfectly fine to produce other measures. But I don't think to say that we can, the trouble is, once you try to go beyond GDP, you're getting into a lot of value judgments. And of course, we must make value judgments. This is what we do. But it's not going to have the same status as this is the number that, that is measuring the market value of stuff. So, and uh, some people say that, people I respect say that the trouble is governments focus on GDP, uh, to which my answer is actually, no, they don't. They, the, the governments uh, have all kinds of stuff that are going on. But the idea that, 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 that my government or your government or anybody else's is actually maximizing GDP. That's not, that's not what's going on. So I don't think that, that, it, that the measure that we use is, is the problem. I think the, the, the underlying values of, of our society are the problem. And could we take another question from the balcony? Yes, uh, thank you very much for coming and speaking here. Um, you mentioned something about having to get through the current crisis of democracy. And it seems in many ways that the world has become increasingly complex despite only having sort of traditional liberal democracy as a potential solution. So you look, for example, Brexit boils down all sorts of problems into a single yes, no referendum. Uh, you mentioned climate change, of course, the question of short term versus long term. My question to you is, do you think that democracy can survive in this increasingly complex world? And uh, what do you think democracy should do in order to do so? So first of all, I'm not sure that the world is more complex than it used to be. I mean, it's been, uh, the world has been complex for a long, long time. Uh, and um, now the question of whether democracy can survive, um, the answer is I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm scared to death, but, uh, but not, I'm, not, I'm not despairing, but I'm terrified. And, uh, um, and you, you know, you, one has to just keep on plugging. Uh, despair is not a helpful emotion here, and, and I don't think it's warranted yet, but in any case, it's not helpful. Um, and the, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I don't think we've found uh, something that's better than liberal democracy. Uh, the, uh, uh, that doesn't mean it will necessarily survive, but, but you know, the, uh, the alternatives are, are all worse. And uh, I guess we just, well, we, we, we will see, but we will also, uh, I hope, uh, try to make the right thing happen. 
Um, and look, there are all kinds of, uh, there are always stresses. There, there is, there's, uh, no, I know US history better than, than, uh, than, than, uh, than UK history and certainly better than a lot of other countries. There has never been a time in America when everything was okay. Right there, there. We, uh, if if I think it's it's like it's an old Billy Joel song. I'm not revealing my uh, my my age here, but you know, they, if you think about all the things over the course of my adult lifetime that have all of the crises, all of the there's never been a time when there weren't a lot of terrifying things. I think that democracy is in more danger now. You're thinking if we didn't start the fire, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought so. Yeah. Uh, there, so you're, sorry, you're, you're yeah, age yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, no, but the, this is. Uh, but you know, the idea that that America. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm I'm uh, of exactly the age where I thought I might be called up to serve in Vietnam after I graduated from college. Uh, they, they, I, I got. Uh, you know, there was a day when I got my lottery number, uh, and it was 295, and I just said, oh. Okay, I'm going to have a life. Uh, now, it turned out they didn't call up anybody from my class. But, it, but you know, the, it, there have been a lot of really bad times in America before. So the idea that, that things have gotten more complex and more difficult, it's just that this time the chance that the really, really bad guys might win in an irreversible way just looks higher than it ever has before. Madam. Thank you. Uh, what is the most persistent zombie idea on the left? Um, and is there one... Is there a, an idea to which you have subscribed in the past, which you now kind of put into that category? Oh boy. Um, I mean, <laughs> the, tr the left is not nearly as good at, at maintaining uh, zombie ideas, uh, partly because there, there are in fact uh, uh, you know, not that many leftist uh, billionaires. Uh, and, and billionaires, <laughs> are there are some, but not very leftist. And uh, um, so, I mean, uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, we were talking about climate and environment and, and climate change and economic growth. I'm running into a lot of people still who are, now this is telling you, I don't think they're a large part of the electorate, but, there are, but the circles I move in, I run into people who are sure that uh, to fight climate change, we have to stop living the way we're living, that a much more austere, uh, back to nature lifestyle is the only way to deal with climate. And that's an idea that uh, it's just clearly wrong. Uh, if we actually ask by, we know enough about the technological and economic solution to climate change that a, a green society that does not burden the planet would almost certainly be a society that looks a whole lot like what we have now. And people would be driving cars, they'd be using electricity, but the cars would be electric and the electricity would be generated by solar and wind. And it, it, but the actual rhythm of daily life could look very much like what we have. We don't have to go back to, to an agrarian uh, uh, pastoral Eden to, to, to deal with the issue. But it's, it's something that sounds Again, it sounds serious from a different point of view. It sounds like if you're serious about climate change, you must be serious in believing that we have to give up on this consumer-oriented society and, and all of these, uh, these comforts that we take for granted. Uh, but in fact, it's not true. So that would be, a, that would be an example of a kind of a left-wing zombie. The, in other countries, you know, the belief that you can just dictate all prices, and, you, know, you can put price controls on everything and, not, and never face shortages, that's not something we see in the U.S., but you know, Venezuela, clearly there's some uh, refusal to, re to face reality going on. But th th that would be the examples. But again, zombies mostly flourish because there's big money behind them. Not all of them, but mostly. And, and, and uh, the, uh, you know, for, for every George Soros, there are uh, 50 quiet billionaires uh, supporting extremely reactionary causes. And what about the, quest, uh, the question of an idea you've changed your mind? Oh, so most of my changes um, uh, have been in the, uh, in the other direction. Uh, uh, look, uh, minimum wages. No, no uh, piece of economic research has, has shaken my views as much. Actually, I'm going to give you two, uh, and, and may, uh, this, this is a great risk of turning into a Monty Python routine. Amongst the issues, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the um, numbers are three. Um, so, okay, so actually, so I'll give you two. One, minimum wages. Uh, up until sometime in the mid-1990s, I believe that clearly increases in minimum wages would cost jobs. 
They might be desirable otherwise, but Econ 101 said that that would happen. And then we got this amazing body of empirical research because we get in the United States, we get a lot of natural experiments when one state raises its minimum wage and the neighboring state does not. And the overwhelming evidence says that minimum wage increases, at least within the range we see in the US, do not cost jobs. And that changed my view. It said labor markets are very different from the way I thought. It actually moved me towards emphasizing the role of power in, in, in labor relations and so on. Um, another one, I used to think that it was always possible just by printing money to get full employment. And, uh, and the experience of Japan in the late 1990s, when despite a very easy monetary policy, they slid into deflation, uh, uh, changed my views totally. I, there, was a, there was a group of, uh, of us actually, uh, when I, when I arrived at Princeton in 2000, there was a bunch of Japan warriors who were really very shaken by the Japanese experience because we, we looked at it and said, you know, this could happen to us. So with me, uh, people you wouldn't have heard of, but very influential in the profession, Lars Fenson, uh, Mike Woodford, and the fourth, what was his name? Bernanke, Ben Bernanke. Don't know what happened to him. Uh, he disappeared, and, I think. Lost yeah, scene. so we, so that, but no, the, the Japanese, um, Japan's lost decade changed my view and basically made me much more Keynesian, much more uh, a believer that there are times when you really need to have the government do the spending. Yes. Uh, sorry. How do you successfully regulate the uh, financial markets um, while not scaring the business community and um, sort of trying to convince the middle upper class that uh, any form of common sense reform or tax is not Marxist-Leninist and it's not going to take away all their assets and money. Okay. Um, you know, we've done this before, right? We, we, we imposed extensive bank regulation in the 30s, um, which didn't obviously cripple the economy. We, uh, the post-war generation was, was the best generation in, in, um, in certainly in US economic history. Um, the, the, the only, I, I would say the problem is not scaring people, not looking Marxist. The problem with regulating financial markets is, well, first of all, the, the financiers uh, have a, a lot of clout, um, but, but beyond that, um, it is hard to keep up with you know, financial innovation, uh, which very often is not innovating in the sense of, of you know, doing things better, but is, is innovating in a way of finding uh, ways to set things up that evade the regulations. So you regulate banks and then people create something that is functionally a bank, but doesn't technically meet the definition of a bank and evades the regulations. Uh, it's hard to keep up with that. And, and um, it, it's not a well-solved problem. In the, uh, uh, we had a significant financial reform in the US un under Obama. Not everything you, I would have wanted, but it was significant. But on, on many of the issues, it depends upon this financial stability council, which has to define uh, systemically important institutions that, that are need, uh, and there's no clear definition. It's kind of, it's like pornography, you know, when you see it, um, which is not a stupid way to do it, but it depends upon having um, uh, honest people of goodwill uh, in charge. And now we have the Trump administration. So, uh, <laughs> so the, Dodd-Frank is not a very effective tool um, and it, it always, it depended upon, upon good leadership and uh, uh, we have not found, I haven't come up with a way to, the thing about you know, regular old fashioned commercial banks uh, the, um, is that that system works. The regulations work, the, the guarantees work um, without requiring that there be smart leadership or good judgment calls at the top. And unfortunately everything we try to do to deal with more modern financial institutions is, requires uh, both goodwill and sophistication, which are both now in very short supply. A question from the balcony, please. Thanks very much. So we've mostly discussed zombie ideas in the kind of domestic policy context. So I wanted to ask about zombie ideas in the international context, in the sense of the Washington consensus and trade liberalization. And specifically, I wanted to ask what your thoughts are on the extent to which countries can still develop by exporting i.e. has the impact of technology and the scale of China made it essentially impossible for trade liberalization to facilitate development? 
Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think empirically it's just uh, the premise is wrong. Um, so we all know about China and we know that China occupies this huge space um, and China is a unique success story. No, nobody else has matched their rates of growth. Um, but it's not the only success story. So when I, I like to talk um, about uh, the, the unfamiliar cases. Uh, Bangladesh, you know, Bangladesh is a desperately poor country and, uh, and compared with working conditions in, in, in the first world, it's, it's, it's horrible. And they have factories that collapse and kill hundreds of workers and, and all of that. Um, but Bangladesh is actually, they've, they've tripled their per capita income. Uh, and uh, they're, they're a very poor country, but they were a country that was right on the edge of, of Malthusian starvation. Uh, and it's all because of the ability to, to export. If, if, uh, if the, the ability, basically, clothing, uh, labor intensive, uh, they've been steadily gaining market share at China's expense because China has been moving upscale. And that's, that's showing that you can get, you know, that's, that's major development, that's a major change. It's, it's not, it's a long way from, uh, from turning into, uh, into Western Europe, but it's, it's, a, it's a very big deal. And it, it, it's showing that, that globalization can still work for, for, for poor countries. So I, that's, uh, that's what the uh, line, uh, uh, Bangladesh is not a, it's not a banana republic, it's a pajama republic. Uh, uh, but, but that, you know, they can make fun of it, but in fact, they're used, that's a very large number of people who yeah. are lifted at least in. some ways above starvation level by globalization. And another question from the balcony, please. L looking at it as a um, economist with a mathematical mind, what impact do you think a shift to proportional representation would have over time as you compare it to the electoral colleges, the first past the post, which we have in the UK, other British Commonwealth yeah. countries, which tend to over time have led to two party states. So what if we shifted the proportional representation? Okay, I mean, first the, 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 US, the, uh, the US electoral college system is monstrosity. Uh, that's, uh, that's not about first past the post, it's about a, a system that at the presidential level gives disproportionate representation to, uh, to some to states with small populations. And at even more important, we have the Senate which uh, where you know, half the senators are elected by 16% of the population. So this is a, th th that's crazy. That's a, a deeply, basically we've, we've evolved into a rotten borough system uh, for half of, of, of the US government. And that's, that's a clear monstrosity. As for the rest, um, I mean, I don't know, I mean, this is not, I'm not a political scientist. I talk to political scientists which by the way is rare for economists. We actually talk, I actually talk to people other, talk. other social sciences and, I, and, and take them seriously. Um, and, but what I would say is that the, the, um, there are places with proportional representation that also manage to be very dysfunctional. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, Israel, I believe, has proportional representation. And um, I would not say that, Israeli politics these past 15 years have been a model of, of, of uh, good ideas and wisdom prevailing. In fact, the, I mean, every system has its problems. And one of the problems with proportional representation is it sometimes causes uh, small factional parties with, uh, uh, with very anti-social uh, goals to, to be kingmakers. Uh, so that's not an easy solution either. I don't really know what the answer is, um, except to say that, that you know, People, people are both uh, uh, generally clever and often nasty, and they can find a way to screw up any system. Question from down here. Yeah. Hi. You said earlier that the American economy is in a pretty strong position. So I was wondering how much you thought Trump could legitimately claim responsibility for that. And then alongside that, what are the strong econ strongest economic arguments to voters for voting against him? Okay. The reason that we're in a relatively strong economic position is that it's basically deficit spending. After years and years of saying, oh, debt is, is an existential threat, then we must have austerity, which really hobbled uh, the, the US re recovery uh, under Obama. As soon as Trump was in office, Republicans said, oh, we don't care about that. I mean, the last two State of the Union speeches have not so much as mentioned the deficit. Um, and that, even though it's badly done, 
uh, it does give a boost to demand. So I guess you could say that it, Trump has uh, gets some credit in the sense that by getting elected, he caused congressional Republicans to stop sabotaging the economy. That's not a, you know, vote Republican and, 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 the, and the economy won't be undermined uh, by, by our sabotage efforts. Uh, so that's not a great electoral slogan, but it might win in the election, I have to say. Uh, um, and I, I lost the, what the rest of that was, but the... Uh, the second part was what are the strong, strongest economic arguments to voters to vote against him? Oh, the thing about Trump is that he's managed to preside over a, an economy that by sort of aggregate measures, unemployment rate uh, is low, GDP growth has been pretty good, not spectacular, but pretty good, um, but which is, is showing um, increased hardship for many people despite that. I mean, we were making huge progress in reducing the number of people without health insurance that has now gone into reverse. The number of people who say that, they're, um, that they are, um, uh, that, that they are postponing or, or, or not undertaking necessary medical treatment because of expense has skyrocketed. Um, and the, the America, like the UK, uh, uh, there's tremendous um, regional divergence. Uh, we have a, a large part of, a, a large parts of, of the, the heartland which are in severe economic decline and social collapse. And that has just accelerated. You know, despite the low overall unemployment rate, the state of affairs in um, eastern Kentucky is terrible. Um, and um, life expectancy, I guess it rose slightly this past year, but you know, mortality rates are rising. Uh, and it's, as Anne Case and Angus Deaton say, deaths of despair, people dying from, from uh, opioids, alcohol, and suicide have been rising uh, despite the strong economy. So it, this is actually that earlier question about GDP. You know, the GDP growth, uh, not saying that, that, that it's false, but under, under the surface of that good GDP growth is actually a substantial increase in misery. Just uh, one final question from the... Hi, thanks, Paul. Um, great to uh, see you here. My question is about the US minimum wage. Uh, yeah. Obviously, it's very, very low compared to what it should be. Um, you know, from visiting the US for the last 25 years, it seems people yeah. are getting, you know, three jobs to make ends meet. Um, what do you think the minimum wage should be? And what are the reasons, other than, you know, losing jobs, that perhaps people have been keeping it down, the minimum wage suppressed? Oh, so I'll answer that in reverse. I mean, the reason the minimum wage has been held down is because, uh, um, uh, employers want cheap labor, and uh, they have a lot of, um, of clout. Um, the question of how high to go is an interesting one, and uh, it's um, the, uh, uh, so even, uh, the, the big move in the U.S. is for $15, um, and uh, that's a, uh, I'd say even uh, $15 an hour, um, even Alan Kruger, who was one of the key researchers on that revelatory work, uh, was a little nervous about 15. Um, uh, and the, the problem is regional. The, the state of New York, the state of California, no problem can have a $15 minimum wage and, and there's absolutely no reason to think that that's economic difficulty. Um, if we're talking about Mississippi or Alabama, places with much lower productivity, you might start to have some job loss at that level. I think that the preponderance of the evidence says that $15 is okay, that there might be some minor job loss in some of the least productive parts of the U.S., but, but overall not a, a big deal. Um, I think 20 I would start to make me really nervous, that, that then you start to really be in problem, uh, in, in potentially problematic territory. Um, but it's, it's one of these things, uh, actually in this case, I think a federal minimum wage of 15 and then higher wages in, 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 local. in, in appropriate states, uh, it makes sense. This is one of these cases where federalism works to our advantage. And, uh, and it's interesting, by the way, Alan Kruger did do at one point, he, he went to, um, to Puerto Rico, which part of the U.S. is subject to the U.S. minimum wage and much lower productivity. And he said there we should be able to see clear evidence that the minimum wage 
cost jobs, and he couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. He said, I, I don't really believe this, but I, I can't find the evidence. So, so I'm, I, for the moment, I said, let's, let's go for 15 and see what happens, and then maybe, maybe look for uh, the uh, high productivity states to, uh, to go beyond that. Great. Uh, I'm so sorry to have to draw it to a conclusion. Um, but you will have the opportunity to meet Paul and, and get the book signed. Uh, for now, uh, please join me in thanking him for a really fascinating debate. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul.